Um, thank you for the warm welcome here. Uh, the first part of the story will be starting a little bit with theory, because this is also very important then to understand the genius procedure, which will be afterward presented by Dr. Bousquet. Because uh, what I'm going to present is a very common technique that is now can now be used in also extreme cases, but the real innovation you will hear in the second lecture. And I'm happy that I can present our research results to you on behalf of my wonderful research group, clinical research group. So, first, let's speak about the basic biological question, how principally does bone heal? Because we have to respect biology and we have to have the knowledge that bone heals in the entire body, whether it is traumatized by an accident or traumatized by iodrogenic procedures, like we do every day when we insert implants. And the answer is quite, quite simple. The first part of every healing process is always the hematoma formation. But for the bone to regenerate, the absolute mandatory prerequisite is always the new blood vessel ingression, the new blood vessel ingrowth into the traumatized site. And always mind, I use the term traumatized because once again, Biology doesn't make a difference between a trauma by an accident or a trauma caused by our work as implantologists and oral surgeons. After this blood vessel ingrowth, because you need oxygen, be delivered to the traumatized site for the healing process, otherwise it will get necrotic. You have the bone callus formation and afterwards you have the bone remodeling. This is the cycle that is valid for fractures, it is valid for osseointegration of dental implants and it is also valid for osseointegration of bone graft materials, whatever origin it might be. This is the cycle of bone healing that takes place every time. But, and this is extremely important, and this was published back in 2009 by Professor Mamoto in Nature, which is one of the most renowned scientific journals worldwide, um, the every healing process in the human body, both soft tissues and hard tissues, is mechanosensitive. And this also relies once again to the blood vessel ingrowth. If you don't immobilize a osteotomy site or an implant site, we speak about the implant's primary stability, you have no blood vessel ingrowth. If there is no blood vessel ingrowth, there is no osteointegration. It is as simple as this. And there are no complicated mechanisms. The complications are in the cascade of the humoral factors that are delivered to the osteotomy side. So this is very important to know. Uh, to know. Vascularization, a prerequisite for proper vascularization, is always immobilization of the surgical site. Orthopedic surgeons know this already for a very long time. They speak about an unstable fixation. That means the blood vessel ingrowth is blocked by the uh, mobility of the inserted implant or whatsoever. In case you have a stable fixation and in case of implants, we speak about primary stability. We have osseointegration. And this was already proven back in 2008 once again, concerning how fast and, and how reliable blood vessels grow into the osseointegration site. Very easy. You just have to compare. If you have a fracture, you need a cast to stabilize the fracture. If you insert an implant and you want to have a proper osseointegration, you will always have to have a primary stability. We all know this. Now, there is another basic biological question which histological structure is the main and only carrier of bone healing and bone regeneration. This is also, once again, very important to know in general medicine, and as a maxillofacial surgeon, I'm a general medical doctor. I learned already 30 years ago, more than 30 years, 40 years ago, 
that the only carrier of bone regeneration is, of course, periosteum. Let's take a look uh, on the structures of the periosteum. First of all, this is of uh, a slide of one of our histological studies of the mandible. You see here the masseter muscle. You see here the periosteum as a functional entity. And you can see here the cortical bone of the uh, mandible and um, the SH denominated structures are Sharpe fibers. But let's take a closer look at the periosteum. The periosteum itself is subdivided into a fibrous layer. It's the stratum fibrosum and, this is now important, it's the stratum osteogenicum. It's the cradle of osteoblasts. And this structure is the only structure that will provide the mineralization of the callus that forms after any osteo um, plastic surgical procedure we do in the oral cavity of a patient. This is extremely important to know because the success of any surgery starts with the integrity of the periosteum. Of course, we also have the endosteum, which also deliver preosteoblasts, but if you keep the periosteum intact, uh, the success rate will increase dramatically. Now, it doesn't have to do primarily with the, with the uh, main issue of today, the crest splitting, but there are some rumors about how does sinus lift work. Um, during our studies uh, on the development of the intralift system, which is a transcrestal hydrodynamic ultrasonic cavitational system to lift the sinus membrane, we also had to do some uh, histological investigations. And once again, you can see exactly the same structures. You see here the respiratory epithelium, which is the difference to the oral mucosa. You see the entity of the periosteum and the um, ciliary epithelium of the Schneiderian membrane. You have the fibrous strate and, extremely important, you have once again the osteogenic strate, the cradle of osteoblasts. And when you take a close look at these small little dots here, these are the pre-osteoblasts that are delivered, provided the sinus membrane is intact after the elevation process, that create the bone. No bone graft material is ever able to create no bone, not even autologous bone, because after three hours, autologous bone contains no vital cells. This is already known since 1960 of the last century and was investigated by Professor Bohr, a very famous orthopedic surgeon at that time. So, once again, you see the entity of the bone and uh, the periosteum, and in this case the ciliary epithelium, together with the Sharpe fibers, this builds up the so-called periosteum, endosteum, Sharpe fiber continuum, because the Sharpe fibers are the information transporters, the smartphones of the bone, giving the information if there are higher loads to build up more bone, or if there is not enough load on the bone to decrease the volume of bone, because this is an evolutionary process we cannot change with uh, iatrogenic processes. We were able to prove this also in a uh, clinical radiological study. You can see here the intralift applied uh, to sinuses in, in, instead of inserting radiopark bone graft materials, we decided to insert non-radiogenic visible collagenous sponges. This is the situation right after the surgery. You don't see anything after the sinus lifting process. But after six months, you can see the centripetal ossification of the augmentation site in all aspects, transversal, sagittal, and horizontal. And approximately after eight to nine months, you see a full restoration, a full uh, restoration, re restoration of the bone in the augmentation side. This is already after six months. You see in the central area there is still not mature autologous bone growth, but when you take a look at the same picture after eight to nine months, you see a full restoration of bone in this side. 
And this is not only our clinical research, this is meanwhile also proven by a lot of other study groups. You see here um, a short list of references concerning this. And right this morning, I received a email from a friend from Lebanon and they made an investigation what the human sinus membrane delivers to the augmentation site and once again it's pre-osteoblasts, it's bone morphing protein, interleukin, everything that is necessary for the body to build new bone. But let's get a little bit further because today we deal about um, ultrasonic surgery and we have to ask ourselves we were doing our surgical procedures until now with rotary <coughs> instruments, with um, hand instruments, etc., etc. Why should I change over to ultrasonic surgery? What is the benefit of doing ultrasonic surgery? So the answer is quite simple. We made a clinical study, and for this I'm very proud that my research group was the first one to do a study like this. We compared uh, one of the more uh, skillful operations like uh, removal of impacted third molars. On one side, we removed the bone, uh, the teeth with rotary instruments, and on the other side, we removed it with purely piezotome surgery. And when you take the pain and swelling uh, with rotary instruments as the as 100% level, and you compare the pain, swelling, the morbidity of the patient. Uh, when you do the same procedure with piezotomes, the astonishing results were you have 50, more than 50% less pain and swelling when you do oral surgery with ultrasonic surgical tools like the piezotome. So this is the macroscopic side that you, that you will be able to see when you do ultrasonic surgery on your patients. On the other hand, of course, we also have to ask the question, but what is the benefit for the success of our surgeries? Um, a study group around Professor Nares from uh, North Carolina University, Chapel Hill, a very famous maxillofacial surgical uh, research institution, found out that if you apply piezotome 2, because he investigated piezotome 1, piezotome 2, and um, rotary instrument against each other, you have a significant improvement of speed of bone remodeling, speed of bone healing and quality of bone healing. And he investigated this both on histological level and on radiographic level. So this is now the ultrastructural proof that using piezotomes causes the bone to heal faster and more reliable. Now, of course, these are single studies that I present to you, but meanwhile, back in 2007, uh, back in 2006 when we started the research cooperation with Actium because uh, a research group in this high technology field cannot work alone, so we had to search for cooperation partners. Uh, we were pretty alone in the, with the, uh, presenting the results of our studies, but meanwhile they are approved by numerous groups worldwide, approving the clinical and the histological and the ultrastructural results of our research. So it's not wishful thinking anymore, it's pure scientific facts that if you use ultrasonic surgical tools, you improve both the success of your surgery, you improve also the post-surgical morbidity of your patients. So it's a win-win situation. Now, before I start to get into the detail with the crest splitting technique, uh, you might also ask uh, where can I apply uh, ultrasonic surgical tools in my daily routine? Well, the answer is very simple. We postulated back in 2005 already that uh, ultrasonic surgery will have to replace rotating instruments within the next 10 years. Now, 2016, we didn't achieve that goal. So let's take another 10 years and hopefully when we meet each other again in 10 years, everybody of you uh, will use then piezotomes to treat your patients. But you can use it for, of course, vertical alveolar crest splitting, the, uh, the main topic of today. Of course, for the transcrestal intralift that we developed for lateral approach sinus lift, 
subperiosteal tunnel technique because also the detachment of the periosteum with ultrasound is superior to any hand instrument. This was proven by Dr. Fonse from the private university um, uh, of dentistry in Krems in Austria. He presented his results last year at the Piezo Surgery Congress in Barcelona. Of course, mandibular nerve transposition, you won't do a surgical procedure like this with rotary instruments, definitely not. I did it once in a while, but it's a very fearful surgical procedure because once the nerve is damaged, um, we are in deep problems. But with ultrasonic surgery, there is almost no risk to harm the mandibular nerve, and so this procedure would be a very good alternative to vertical augmentation in the lateral mandible. And of course, you can use it for distraction osteotomy, sandwich osteotomy, and the transferral of bone block grafting. For, the, uh, for this part, you will hear then the lecture of Dr. Bousquet showing you how you can use this technique for distraction, for bone distraction. Now, the reason why we developed the um, crest split surgical tools for the piezotone was simply that in about 70% of patients, we have enough bone height above the mandibular nerve or under the sinus, but we don't have the proper crest width to insert implants. And of course, the crest splitting technique is a well-known technique, but it is limited since the instruments were not proper to perform it easily and predictable. So the aim of the development of the, and it's a little bit a long word, it's called the flapless piezotome enhanced crest splitting and widening technique. I will just speak about crest splitting during this lecture. Was as follows. First of all, and <coughs> remember the first part of the lecture, Keep vascularization of the distracted bone plate fully intact. It's better to distract a vital bone, just create a very, very precise fracture, and the procedures are like the body reacts towards a simple fracture. It will heal without complications. Second aim was to keep the period periosteum uh, Sharpe fiber and osteum structural continuum fully intact because the signal pathways for the bone to remodel properly, they are by the Sharpe fibers. And if you cut the Sharpe fibers very precise, you don't destroy the entire structure of this information system of the bone. Third, to enable crest splitting, also on alveolar crest width of less than two millimeters, because with current instruments, it's almost impossible to do crest splittings beyond a alveolar crest width of three millimeters. Now we were able, and I will show you the results afterwards, to narrow this down to one millimeter. And of course, to reduce and avoid procedural bone loss. This is another important issue. When you use rotary instruments for bone surgical procedures, you are destroying bone, you're removing bone, but this bone is what we urgently need to insert implants. So why should you s remove bone to do then later on an augmentation? And this is one of the biggest advantages you will see on your first surgery with piezotomes, that you have no procedural bone loss. You can work now, like a Swiss watchmaker, with highest precision, and you can design your osteotomies on one hand, and on the other hand, you're not going to lose bone when you use these ultrasonic surgical tools. Fifth, of course, we want to reduce and avoid bone resorption in the healing period. So this is why we targeted at the flapless procedure. If you don't remove the periosteum from the bone you do the surgery on. You don't interrupt the nutrition of the bone, and this means you don't interrupt the vascularization of the bone. This means you don't interrupt the oxygen transport to the bone, and that means that you are not going to lose the bone during the healing period, because the nutrition of the bone is kept alive. Oxygen is the basis that we need for living tissues. If you don't interrupt it, you will have no procedural bone loss 
only due to creating a big mucoperiostal flap. And of course, last but not least, we wanted to reduce patient morbidity. The path to this target until we achieved the final results was quite difficult. Because first of all, we had to know how are the biomechanical abilities of the bone. So we did a lot of animal experiments, we did a lot of experiments on cow ribs, and we found out if you do a distraction of the bone of more than 30 degrees, you have a dramatical increase of iatrogenic accidental fractures on the baseline. So this is just to explain to you why we developed the protocol as I'm going to present it to you today. And of course, we compared this with other devices um, that are used for horizontal distraction of the bone. And as you can see in the results, and these are the uh, results of the experimental studies, when we compare it with other technologies to do horizontal distractions, the accidental fracture rate uh, on the base of the osteotomy is only 2% versus 18% and 35% with um, other technologies. It doesn't depend on the instruments, it just depends on the precision of the osteotomy and on the right depth of the osteotomy because we have to respect the biomechanical properties of the bone. It's like if you jump from here down to here, nothing would happen. If I jump up from up here down to here, I will break my leg. It's as simple as this, because it's just biomechanical issues. So this was the first step to develop, first of all, the tips. You can see here the prototypes that were manufactured in um, cooperation with Actium Company, because nobody could afford uh, developing it out of his own pocket. The new university has the money to develop tips like this, because it's pretty expensive when we speak about ultrasonics. And this is now the final tip set, which is the result of the clinical studies, which you can see here. And I will show you afterward on a real case how this works. But let's get back to the basic protocol. So once you might decide to do your first vertical alveolar crest split and horizontal widening with ultrasonics, you should choose a patient, of course, a so-called easy case. I mean, actually, there are no easy cases. There are only cases in um, oral surgery which are managed in the correct way. And if you have a failure, first of all, we always have to ask ourselves, what did I do wrong? And then ask the question, what did the patient wrong, maybe? But you should start with predictable cases. The case I will show you afterward is an extreme case. Once you are trained, you know the learning curve with the new method. You have to have the proper feeling for this method. And then you can reduce your indication to extremely narrow alveolar crest. But first of all, to achieve a distraction angle of not more than 30 degrees, you have to go down with the primary osteotomy for 8 millimeters. Second, you need another two or three millimeters to insert simultaneously primarily stable implants into the native bone. And when we speak about the mandible, we need some kind of safety reserve height above the mandibular nerve. So your first case should have an alveolar crest height above the mandibular canal of minimum 12 millimeters. Here you can see then the final result. You do all the osteotomies, then you do the widening, you insert the implants, and in the gaps between the implants, you, um, you can place some self-hardening bone graft material or autologous bone blocks to keep the entire site stable. Let's take a short look on the uh, surgical protocol step by step. Because this is very important, one of the steps which cannot be cancelled will be the lateral relief, the buccal relief osteotomies. 
And this is one of the points where it might take some time during the procedure when you do it on your patient, but it's vital to be successful. So you can see here now the handpiece of uh, the piezotome. We have here the situation of a very narrow alveolar crest. And contrary to current techniques, instead of preparing a full mucoperiostal flap on the buccal side, you just do a mesiodistal incision and you open it slightly like a booklet flap in order to see the top of the alveolar crest. You have here the depth markings on the CS1 tip. Adjustment should be in mode D2. And the first step you do is you do the mesiodistal vertical osteotomy going from the distal to the mesial tooth. And you always have to go down to the last marking, which is 8 millimeter. This is very important. You should always do this, especially in the mandible. Then with the CS2 tip, you always also have the markings here, down to 8 millimeters. You do a first widening. The first widening is important for the next step that you will see in the next sequence. Once again, you have to go down 8 millimeters. And now you have to do the buccal relief osteotomies. And this is of utmost importance. Now you will ask yourself, but how does it work? I mean, I have no mucoperiostal flap here. Instead of doing the buccal relief osteotomy from outside to the inside, you just go straight in and you do the osteotomy from the inside to the outside. This is why you don't need a full thickness mucoperiostal flap. And of course, you do this on the distal aspect and the mesial aspect. And this is how it should then look like when you do a CBCT scan. It's like creating a door blade and the hinge of the door blade is the innate elasticity of the bone. Now, once this is done, this is the door blade, the elasticity of the, of the bone is the hinge which you have at any door blade, which you can see here. And then, step by step, to avoid accidental fractures of the bone, you start the widening process with always wider tips. And for a proper cooling, once they were perforated, now we have a new design with proper cooling, but a much higher speed for the distraction process. And at the end, with the last tip, you will widen the distraction side to a width of four millimeters which is absolutely suitable for any implant system that you might use. To insert an implant of a diameter of four millimeters is completely sufficient for every molar and premolar situation. So in the next step, of course, uh, the depth of the osteotomy is eight millimeter. You're going to choose a 11 millimeter or 12 millimeter implant, depending on the measurements of your implant system and then you insert the implants primarily stable. And this is also an essential point. And the gaps in between you can fill with the self-hardening bone graft material, for instance. But this is essential because, as you have seen before, bone is elastic. I mean, you couldn't breathe if bone wouldn't be elastic. The mandible bone and the maxillary bone is elastic. Only the long bones are containing high amounts of hydroxyapatite to endure high pressure forces. And the elasticity means that if you do the widening and you remove the instrument for the widening, the gap will close again. You have to keep it open. And to keep it open, you need the door stopper. And in this case, the door stopper is simply the implant. Now, let's take a look how this works in reality. We have here now the first case you see the mesiodistal incision, just a slight opening, we call it booklet flap, to identify the top of the alveolar crest. Then we take the CS1 tip to do the mesiodistal vertical osteotomy. This is how it looks like when the piezotome is in action. This is now the primary widening with the CS2 tip. Now, we do the mesial and distal buccal relief osteotomy with CS3, and this is important. You are not supposed and you are not, let's say, allowed to skip this step. Because if you don't the buccal relief osteotomies, especially in the mandible, 
you will have accidental uncontrolled fractures somewhere here. And this process might take some minutes, but it pays because you achieve the ultimate precision in the distraction sequence. So once this is done, you do the widening with uh, CS4, CS5, and CS6 until you achieve the final result of having a gap of four millimeters. You can see here, small booklet flap, this is the lingual bone plate, and this is the buccal bone plate. So in the next step, you do the pilot drilling for your implants. I always check them with pins for proper anatomical position of the implants. Then in the next step, you insert the implants, and I will tell you why in cases of uh, alveolar crest width of only one millimeter or less, you should insert them slightly subcrestally because the narrower the alveolar crest gets, of course, also with this method, you will have some procedural vertical bone loss. The amount is very, very small, but at the end, you have to take this into consideration. Then you fill the remaining gap with uh, self-hardening bone graft material. We mostly use easy graft crystal, which is a hydroxyapatite containing self-hardening bone graft material. But of course, you can also use autologous bone blocks cut with the piezotome to fit into this gap. And at the end, you have the tensionless wound closure. And after 3.5 months, in this case, we reopened the site by a punch procedure. And then the prosthetic treatment was finished. And of course, the, once again, the patient had no pain and swelling after this procedure because it was uh, almost like a simple tooth extraction. Now, let's take a look at the radiographic follow-up. You can see here the original situation. We have 12.2 millimeters above the mandible nerve. This is then the situation immediately after surgery. You see here the buccal relief osteotomy distal, buccal relief osteotomy mesial, and the granular you see here. These are the bone, the self-hardening bone graft material, plus the two inserted Q implants, which were developed by um, a member of our research group, uh, Dr. Andreas Kurek. This is then the uh, prosthetic treatment situation after 3.5 months. And we take now the prosthetic uh, plateau of the implant as a measure point for the further investigations on vertical bone loss with this method. So you can see here, this is the situation after one year we see there is almost no bone loss. It's about 1.2 millimeter as far as uh, radiographic uh, investigations like this are reliable enough. This is the situation then after two years, and this is the situation after three years. You see, in this extreme case, there was almost no vertical bone loss around the implants. And this is very important because nowadays people don't want to have their implants for one year or two years. They want to have it for 10 years, for 15 years. And we know now from our studies on a longer range of time after the uh, flapless crest splitting that after the third year, there is almost no chance to endure further vertical alveolar bone loss only in case the patient suffers of peri-implantitis, but this then has, has nothing to do uh, with the basic procedure of the flapless crest split, because this is infection. Let's take a look at the results. So, of course, we had to uh, achieve a high number of patients with a high number of crest splitting sites and uh, with uh, approximately 400, uh, with 488 inserted implants. The Mean osteotomy depth was, according to our protocol, 8 millimeters, and this is very important. Don't try to make any compromises. You have to go down to 8 millimeters. The average osteotomy length was 22 millimeters. The minimum, and this is where the indication stops to do this flapless crest split, is 7 millimeters. The maximum is not defined because uh, sometimes we have to split an entire upper arch, and this is also possible with this method, and only with this method, because you cannot do a complete osteotomy of an arch with any rotary or oscillating instrument. 
And as you can see here, when you follow the protocol, there will be no baseline fractures, there are no vertical fractures, accidentally, and the wound gap, because we are working flapless, you cannot then afterwards prepare a mucoperiosteal flap to get a tensionless wound closure. The average wound gap width is only 0.5 millimeters, and this is less than, at, than after any simple tooth extraction. So, this you just leave open as it is and it will heal within one or two weeks by secondary epitalization, exactly like after a tooth extraction. And the insertion torque values, one of the most important values you can measure during implant insertion, um, which predicts the long-term success rates of your implants, which is the insertion torque value of the implant, was minimum 30 newton centimeters, maximum 55 newton centimeters, an average of 40 newton centimeters, which is, according to the current literature, more than sufficient as primary stability of the implants. So let's speak about the success or the failure rates. In the first year, we lost three implants in the lower jaw in group one. In the second year, we lost one implant in the lower jaw and, oh sorry, in the upper jaw and in the third year we lost two implants of the 488 in the lower jaw, which makes a cumulative uh, failure rate in the upper jaw of 1.9% and the cumulative failure rate in the lower jaw of 1.2%, which adds up to a total success rate of 98.8%. So this is compared to the literature um, when we speak about other techniques for vertical crest splitting and horizontal widening. This is far superior than with any other instruments um, you might do this procedure with. And what is also very interesting, the distribution of the surgical site. Mostly you will have to use this procedure in the upper jaw in the anterior region from K9 to K9 and in the lateral mandible, in the lateral uh, mandible molar and premolar side, in the lower front and in the upper premolar area, um, there are better chances that you might find um, enough bone width and not to have uh, to proceed with the flapless crest splitting technique. This is just as a comparison, a case in the upper jaw. This is the original situation before surgery. This is a CBCT scan after the crest splitting and widening intrasurgically. This is then the situation after the insertion of the two Q implants, and here is the clinical site. Now, the target of our investigations and of our development was, of course, to see and to compare to other techniques, but what are then the real final outcome after some years. What are the bone losses that we have to await when we do this procedure? You can see here now the cumulative results is that if you take all crest splits we did together, the average vertical bone loss was about 0.8 millimeter. That means less than one millimeter. If you take the group two, which was the group that presented more than two millimeter of alveolar crest width, you see that the average vertical bone loss was only 0.7 millimeters. Instead, when you take group one, which was the group where the alveol original alveolar crest width was only one to two millimeters, you have a significant higher vertical bone loss of approximately one millimeter. And this is the reason why I suggest that in cases when you do very narrow crests, that you insert the implants subcrestally for about one millimeter, so that at the end, after three years, you will not have some threads um, lying open to the oral cavity. So this is very important. But when you compare these results with the current literature on uh, other techniques for vertical crest splitting and widening, we are significantly better off with a bone average bone loss of only one millimeter compared to sometimes 
two, three or four millimeters vertical bone loss within the first three years. And once again, the issue is always the vascularization. If you don't remove a flap and you keep the bone living and the, you keep the nutrition upright, then you are not going to lose bone during the healing cycle. So for this, you always have to ask yourself also, if you are the patient, hopefully you're not going to be a patient yourself to another oral surgeon, but mostly we will be patients to general surgeons. But if you would have to choose how you would be treated, I don't think you would be like to be treated like this. And I mean, it's a funny photo, of course, because these are coarse instruments, but just imagine this is polished chrome and this is a simple hammer. This is how we work now in oral surgery, like in the Stone Ages. But I'm pretty sure that you would like to choose this kind of therapy because we have to respect that there is an evolution also in oral surgery. And once we know that the method is better than traditional methods, we are ethically obliged to use these methods. This is not only my firm belief, this is my firm knowledge, and my patients are very thankful to me that I have this knowledge of better procedures. So I hope I could give you some um, primary insights into the benefits of ultrasonic surgery. And if you want to... Um, uh, review this lecture and all other lectures on, uh, at our International Academy of Ultrasonic Surgery and Implantology. This is the download link for all lectures. You are free to use it. There is no registration necessary and there is no payment necessary. And if you want to see cases in real life surgery, you can visit our YouTube educational channel where you can see uh, surgical procedures from uh, ultrasonic surgeons all over the world. So I thank you very much for your kind attention and if you have some questions I will answer them now. Thank you very much. What are the advantages, the advantages uh, uh, comparing to uh, laser using for this technique? Uh, uh, you mean laser osteotomies? Yes. Well, actually, actually, to tell you the truth, um, back in 1988, we were maybe the first ones at the maxillofacial surgery department at the University in Vienna investigating lasers in bone surgery. And it turned out that um, actually you cannot really cut bone precisely and predictable with lasers. Even if um, some lasers company um, try to make you believe because um, once you know what a laser beam is, you know that it is not possible because a laser beam is a light beam. And how can you steer the depth of the osteotomy? Because if you go down for one or two millimeters, even if you could properly cut bone with lasers without terminal side effects, once you are deep in for about four millimeters, you completely lose orientation and nothing prevents that you might cut the mandibular nerve with the lasers. So lasers are nice in soft tissue uh, surgery. Lasers are nice maybe in hard tissue surgery using the photoacoustic effect. But in oral surgery and uh, diligent procedures like this, I'm pretty sure that it's still valid what we found out already in 1988. Unfortunately, lasers have no place there. Angelo, uh, congratulations on a beautiful presentation as usual. I just have one short question. Uh, since you did not reflect any flaps, yep. did you ever have any dehiscence of uh, you know, the cover screws or opening of the cover screws? Yes, um, okay. you're right. Uh, the, average, the average gap we had to uh, face was approximately 0.5 millimeters. But especially when we used uh, the bone graft material easy graft, and for this, I mean, you are the expert because uh, Ashish, I have to explain this, he's a very good friend and he's also member of the Biomaterial Experts Group. Uh, we have a secondary epitalization within one or two weeks. But nowadays, and for this, the French participants might know him, 
instead of then reversing a mucoperiostal flap, you can use the APRF technique from Professor Joseph Shukrun and you suture the APRF membrane on top of the gap and then you will have an even more perfect and even faster secondary epitalization. But um, unfortunately, you remember Bernie, uh, Bernie Fuchs, um, a oral surgeon from Switzerland. He always left it completely open and in his publication he was able even to prove that even if you leave it open for two or three millimeters, if there is no infection, you will have secondary epitalization because the healing process is exactly like any tooth extraction site. But to be on the safe side, either you use self-hardening bone graft materials or you use APRF or if you don't have both, you can just cut out a small stripe of collagen membrane and suture it on top of the uh, bootlet flap. But don't reverse then only for the sake of placing a membrane then a full mucoperiostal flap because this will then uh, interfere with the healing results. I think there was another question. Hi. <laughs> uh, from your representation, thank you very much for that. So. I didn't see that you loaded immediately. Would you be kind just to tell us what is the advantages or disadvantage of an immediate load? Let's put it that way. This is a very emotional question because we know by the works of Canizzaro, um, there are, let's say, two schools in implantology. There is the school following more the noble biocare direction that for immediate loading, 35 Newton centimeters in surgeon torque value are enough for immediate loading. I'm more on the Italian side. My first name is Angelo, although I'm not an Italian. Um, on the side of Canizzaro, he made investigations for about 20 to 30,000 implants. And he found out that uh, two-stage implant and single-stage implant insertion with immediate loading starts to be equal in the overall results rates over five to ten years, starts with 50 Newton centimeters. Since we can achieve in the mandible approximately average 40 Newton centimeters, I personally don't want to take the risk for my patients. And it also depends on the implant system that you use. So that means if you follow more the philosophy that 35 Newton centimeters are enough for immediate loading. Of course, you can do this also with the quest plating technique. Once you achieve 35 Newton centimeters and you place a uh, provisional resin bridge over the wound, then you have a perfect wound cover. But if you want to be on the very safe side, you know, the question is only primary stability and immobilization. If the patient has parafunctions, and right today, parafunctions are growing because the overall situation in our world is not so pleasant right now. So if you have parafunctions, these will exceed the insertion torque value, and then you have mobilization, and then you might lose the implant, only because the patient didn't want to wait for three months. So. I think the best way to do it, when you know your patient extremely well, and maybe then you have one patient where you say 35 Newton centimeter immediate loading, I know you, You're, you have no bruxism, you have a perfect oral hygiene, we can do this with this patient. On the other hand, maybe there is a new patient you don't know, maybe you see some signs of parafunction, you will achieve exactly the same, maybe even 40 Newton centimeters, but then you decide no, in this case, I will go two-stage. But for this, I cannot give you a general guideline or a rule that is safe, because we are always dealing with individual patients. Thank you very much for such a kind presentation. It's a minimal invasive approach, and it's very interesting. Uh, in the resorption values in a curve that you yep. showed us, between the first and the third group was only 0 0.28 millimeter difference. Was it statistically significant? Yes, it was. Okay, thank you. It was. So this is why uh, once you have only one millimeter alveolar crest width and you split, you should really go subcrestal because this is very important because some implant systems, they have threaded necks and if they are exposed 
and they get infected, then you might lose the implant. And we always want to be on the safe side. Uh, in your first part with the sinus lift, yes. how you can be sure that after lifting with a piece of the membrane, it will not collapse later? Uh, well, this is very easy. In, for the study, we use collagen sponges because we wanted to visualize the remineralization process originating from the sinus membrane. But normally, we just put a granulate bone graft material. Whatever you want to use, put it there. If the sinus membrane, which is periosteum, stays intact, it will get bone, if you like it or not. That's the to beautiful... To keep the gap, to keep the, the, the to membrane keep lifted. To keep the volume yes. open, yes. Okay, thank you.